start by thanking you all for turning up in the last <laughs> afternoon of the last day, considering how many people I've seen in suitcases today. I, uh, I wasn't hopeful. Um, so yes, today I wanted to talk uh, a little bit about the um, ongoing project, which is the uh, excavation of uh, the farm at Hofstad in Mewasweit. And just to start off by uh, locating ourselves, uh, Mewasweit is the area which surrounds Lake Mewa up here in, in uh, northern Iceland. Um, and our farm Hofstade actually sits here on the bank of the Lachau River, which runs from the lake and, and up to the sea to the north. Um, and this is the farm of Hofstade. Um, and it's the most uh, intensely excavated and investigated uh, farm in Iceland, with over 100 years of, of uh, research history there. Uh, and the excavation has focused on, on two sites. It's the, the Viking Age longhouse uh, and the sort of early Christian cemetery. Um, now, the, there have been uh, several investigations of the Viking Age longhouse, starting with Daniel Brun in, in 1908, um, and ending with the investigation, uh, the excavation of the whole site uh, by the Institute of Archaeology. Um, uh, under the direction of Gavard Lucas. And just to jump directly to the results of that, um, can you see this? Yeah. Um, basically, uh, what was discovered on the site was uh, the remains of the largest known uh, Viking Age longhouse in Iceland. It's almost 40 metres long, um, with uh, several sort of ancillary buildings. Uh, uh, Smithies, pit house, uh, sort of small hall, food storage area, uh, and even a latrine. Um, we've done extensive geophysical surveys of the surrounding area, so we know that these are all the, the buildings on site. Um, the interpretation of the Hofstad Viking Age ruin has, has um, sort of gone through a bit of a cycle. Um, obviously, uh, Daniel Brun <coughs> in 1908 was <coughs> associated with the name Hofstadler Kov, meaning temple, so temple place. Um, and his interpretation was that it was a temple. Um, when uh, the Institute returned there, uh, it was with the idea that it was most likely just a very big farm. Um, the interpretation then sort of went a bit of a circle. Um, as there were sort of various indications that, although yes, there had most likely been a working farm on the site, um, uh, there were sort of indications that, that it had other functions and, and, and the final interpretation that it was um, a feasting hall, so that although there was a sort of regular sized farm run on the site, uh, the large size of the, of the farm could be explained by this sort of ultimate function. Uh, now there are various features which sort of suggest this, um, one is the very, very small size of the fireplace. So Hofstadler um, is, is the largest known Viking Age uh, longhouse um, with the very smallest hearth. Uh, and for comparative purposes, this is a two-scale uh, plan of Aarhusvete, the regular contemporary site, which is, as you can see, half the size of twice the size of the hearth. So this hearth at Hofstadler is very unlikely to have been able to heat the entire house. Uh, for, for winter occupation. Um, however, the sort of main thing that uh, resulted in this interpretation is based on the um, work of Tom McGovern, who's sitting here in the back. Um, um, and that's these guys. Uh, surrounding the entire uh, longhouse were discovered remains of 23 uh, cattle skulls. Uh, and these had all been uh, decapitated, which is uh, not a good way to kill cattle if you want to use the meat and the blood, but a very good way if you want a nice big blood splatter of everything. Um, the horse had not been removed for use, um, and the skulls had clearly been uh, displayed. They were weathered on the front, not at the back. Um, so it seems that the whole the hall was decorated with these sort of decapitated, um, ritually killed <coughs> cattle skulls, indicating a, a, a sort of uh, <coughs> a pagan nature to the to the to the site. Um, 
if we sort of do a quick look at the dating of the site, there's been some uh, finessing of, of this done recently, um, but it doesn't really affect what I want to talk about here, which is the, the dating of the long house itself. Um, it's sort of built uh, late 10th century, and it's really an occupation for a really long, a short time, uh, only about 100 years, and is abandoned by the ele early 11th century. If we jump back to the, to the, host, the farm, uh, and the cemetery site, which was uh, excavated by myself for several seasons, and um, we finished on site last year, and so uh, post -ex is just starting. Um, I'm quite grateful for Gwyni, because those of you who were here listening to her before, she sort of set the scene quite nicely for me, so we have a very similar um, early Christian cemetery, uh, slightly larger than the ones that Gwyni showed us. It's over 20 metres in diameter, uh, octagonal turf built enclosure, uh, remains of, of three, but at least two, perhaps three phases of central church, and then the surrounding uh, cemetery. Uh, 180 burials, uh, we have 170 skeletons preserved. Uh, just to have a quick look at these three phases of church, the earliest uh, was only uh, four by four metres, not really much left except the four corner <coughs> post pads. Um, and slight patches of floor in the centre. Uh, the best preserved church was this one. We can tell from the technology it's, it's constructed pre before 1300. Um, you can see the re where the earlier church stood here, the grey. Um, but this one was even smaller, three by three metres. Uh, clearly a stave built church with very large, sort of 80 centimetre corner posts uh, and flat stones marking the edge and then a small porch. Um, our current theory is that it was possibly quite a, a tall structure. Uh, we can't see any other reason for needing these massive posts for a, for a building that's only three by three metres. Um, so some sort of, if we imagine the Norwegian stave churches, the sort of central tower uh, is, a, is what we're sort of thinking in terms of there's no evidence of there being a, a balcony surrounding it, but a, a tall structure. Uh, the last structure on the site is turf built. It's built post 1477. It's of a similar size and in the same location as the earlier churches, um, but it's very, very badly damaged because that's what happens when you drive a bulldozer over, over your structures. Um, so we can't really say anything about its function, but it's, it's there in the same location. Uh, the farm mound at Hofstad is just adjacent to the site, so it could possibly be uh, something associated with that. We just don't know. Um, like I said, the burial surrounding um, cemetery, a similar pattern to what Gwyni explained with, with uh, uh, women to the north and men to the south, but not so clear cut as, as with her. Um, children in two clusters, one immediately in, uh, south of the chapel and another one down here. Uh, very obvious clustering, it clearly has some meaning, which I can't tell you about because I haven't analysed the material yet. Um, these are all inhumation burials orientated east to west. We have none taken out, but some brought in. Um, so a handful of these, these disturbed burials. Uh, but of the 170, we have those um, 90 children, most of the neonates. So it's a really nice site for the demography that is probably quite accurate. We have this evidence for this very high infant mortality. But I'm not going to talk about that today. So. Uh, the dating of the site, um, for, the, for the structural remains, we can see that um, the earliest features that are being built most likely in the late 10th century. Uh, we have some radiocarbon dates from the floor of the earlier structure, uh, and the best dating evidence is really the technology of the boundary wall itself, which is clearly being built uh, very shortly after the 940 uh, eruption. Um, when it ends, is more difficult, sort of depends on how you interpret that last structure, which is, like I say, post-1477. Um, so the burials clearly ceased before 1300, and well before 1300. We have, have no, no burials um, cutting through 1300 tephra. So, if we go back to our little table um, and add our church here, um, what I really want to talk today is, is this... Is this uh, 
contemporary unity of the, of the Longhouse and the Christian church. So on one hand, we have a Viking age Longhouse with some very obvious pagan connotations of ritualistic killing and, and decoration with <coughs> bulls or chapel skulls. Um, and on the other hand, uh, a very obviously Christian cemetery. Um, and although they might not have overlapped very much, or we've maybe talked in a couple of decades, uh, everything points to the fact that they existed at the same time. Um, if we just place this into uh, the context of Iceland, Iceland of course settled in the late 9th century, um, and the sort of documented date of the conversion to Christianity is AD 1000. Um, if you're wondering why I have a, man, a reclining man there, this is a Thorgeir Ljósagningarbæði, wow, completely. Who, who, who lay under a blanket for a few days in, 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 in a, a thousand and came to the conclusion we should turn to Christianity, <coughs> although we were allowed to be pagan just as long as we were <coughs> um, What we don't know and what the written sources and, and the archaeology doesn't really tell us anything about is this pro- process of Christianization, how this happened. And this lack of data which sort of where information was sort of suggested that uh, it seems to have been quite a peaceful pro- process. There's no, no evidence of this having been uh, uh, happening in, in any sort of angry or violent manner. Um, with the archaeology, the best evidence we have for religion is, of course, the burial. Um, a very simplified view of, of burial archaeology in Iceland um, is that we have, of course, the, the pre Christian Viking burials. These tend to be small sites. The uh, largest we have has 14 graves, um, inhumation burials with grave goods. Um, and then we have the, the <coughs> Christian cemeteries, which are like Hofstadler and then like where they discussed here. Um, what we don't have is really any convincing evidence of any sort of uh, crossover. We don't find um, <coughs> artifacts with, with Christian symbolism in the, in the, in the pagan graves. And we don't find any, any obviously convincing evidence of pagan customs sort of extending into the Christian period. We seem to be, um, we don't, we, we're just not seeing that in any obvious fashion. Um, which sort of makes it <coughs> interesting is that, in that, at least for some, for, a, for some years, some decades, there seems to be the, have been this coexistence of, of on the other hand, one hand, this quite pagan uh, uh, structure, and the other hand, um, the Christian uh, church. Um, one of the sort of theories about the construction of the of the scowling to have this extremely big um, uh, long house uh, on a farm that does not appear to be a, a settlement farm. It's the, the long house is built. Up late. <coughs> there are other sites in the area which are, are built up earlier. And, and this very um, short occupation is that it's it's some sort of uh, some someone trying to build up status to 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 sort of set their mark on the area. Um, if you visit Mivasvik today, um, you find most of the most of the farms are sort of uh, around Miva. Um, if you if you drive the ring road around, you can see all the farms from the road. Uh, Hofstad is really the only one which is not visible from the road. It's sort of hidden away, and it feels quite isolated. Um, but during the time when, when uh, <coughs> the church and the, and the scowling, uh, it's most likely that the, the main route into Mimashoed would have been along the valley, um, mainly from, from the sea to the north. Um, and then we can imagine that when people were travelling in there, the site of the scowling and possibly called the church met, met them as they came into the area. Um, so, so this sort of seems to have been uh, a marker, sort of setting their mark on the, on the entrance into the, into the, into the area. Um, I said at the beginning that the work is ongoing, um, and we've, Gavin Lucas, who excavated the, the Viking Age Longhouse, is now uh, applied for funding to excavate the farm of Tosberg. And the farmland is basically this rough area uh, right adjacent to the cemetery. Uh, it was abandoned in the 1950s when this house was built. Uh, 
we've got some nice two kisses to, that demonstrates that the uh, younger structures are there and they're nicely preserved. Um, but we, uh, what we also see, because we were sort of starting, we're getting uh, material from the farmland spilling into the cemetery. Uh, and what we actually found is that there is something happening there um, very early on. We were getting um, uh, midden deposits with Viking Age material at the very base up against the boundary of the church. Um, and in this corner, we had a large uh, early modern rubbish pit. And in that, we could see uh, <coughs> turf walls that predate the church. So hopefully, we will be able to continue because that will sort of seal the story of what's happening at Hofstra if, if we actually discover that there is the farm mound has been built up prior to the long house. It will sort of enrich our, uh, the story of, uh, of the site. So, um, Hopefully that will happen, which means that 2017 to 2021 there will be lots of activity at Costa if you're ever nice um, And I think that's. Ooh.